the Q&A function. I'll now hand you over to your host for today's session, Margot Hoyt, head of LHH's North American Leadership Development Business. Margot, over to you. Thank you so much and welcome everybody. I'm just so pleased to be here today with you in what Dylan uh, reminded us is the second in the 2023 conversation series for women in leadership. Um, LHH, for those of you who may not know us in our full extent, is a global uh, organization in the talent solutions industry. Uh, you may know about us from our recruitment solutions where we help organizations to bring in terrific talent. Uh, you may also be familiar with us for our career transition and mobility business, where those who are taking their careers out of one organization and into another are guided through that process or guided through the mobility within your own organizations. Uh, and then there's our leadership development business, which as Dylan mentioned, is where I sit in the organization. I lead our North American leadership development practice. Uh, and we, of course, help leaders to really be strategically prepared or have the capability to lead strategies and organizations. Um, wonderful work that we do and very pleased to be uh, bringing you this particular conversation series. Um, today, we have Cheryl Fullerton with us. Let me tell you a little bit about her and why we're excited to be having her as part of this conversation. Cheryl is the Executive Vice President, People and Communications at Chorus Entertainment where she leads their people strategy with accountability for all of the HR function, communications, as well as the company's cor corporate social responsibility efforts. Her prior career includes a wealth of diverse industry experiences, including retail, manufacturing, consumer packaged goods, and business services. She also chairs the Board of Women in Communication and Technology. She's an avid supporter of industry organizations such as Women in Film and Television Toronto, and personally acts as a mentor in that mentorship program at the Women um, in Film and Television Toronto. Uh, we're so pleased to have you with us, Cheryl. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. This is how we're going to be spending about the next 60 minutes together. So as a reminder for, to those of you who may be new to this conversation series, Cheryl and I are going to have an intimate conversation and you're going to be part of that for about the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, we'll cover a variety of topics. I know that this will spur questions in your mind. And so please use the Q&A function that we have here to put those questions in. Uh, we will get to those questions at about half past 25 to the hour, and we'll get through as many of your questions as we possibly can before wrapping up at the top of the hour. So without further ado, Cheryl, let's start to dive in, shall we? Yes, I'm juggling my papers. I'm ready to go. Excellent. Okay. So I want to start with really kind of an open question so people get a chance to know you and a little bit more about your story. So can you tell us a bit about some of the turning points or inspiration that have led to your career success so far? So far, that means there's so much more to go. I like that. So much more, I so say, much more. Uh, turning point, I guess, I mean, you have to start at the beginning a little bit. And the first turning point was a, a lack of a decision, to be honest. It was being so uncertain about what I wanted for my life and my career that um, I asked the company where I had been in a summer job, a temporary summer job, if I could just stay for a while while I figured things out. And, and that started me down a path that I hadn't chosen, but turned out to be something I ended up loving. It happened to be in an HR department of a corporation, very rich, dynamic corporation with lots of opportunity. Um, so, so that was the first turning point was an accident. I'd say beyond that, um, the biggest turning points have been when I made purposeful choices. So the first one may have been by accident, but the other ones were when I really thought about what it was I wanted for my life, my career, what I was getting about where I was, what the value it was for me, what value I had for them, and then trying to figure out what was next. Those are really the points in my career that were the most meaningful to progression um, but also to personal happiness. You triggered for me a couple of questions around, you know, there's a phase of life kind of thing here. So you said to you at a specific time, um, and I, I, I know that women struggle sometimes with when am I, when is it going to be different or choices that I make today in this stage of life, how does that impact me in the future? What are your thoughts around that whole concept of, you know, making choices for where you are 
in the current moment? Um, are you thinking about choices like balance type choices or career progression type choices? Well, I think, there's, there's I think they probably interrelate, don't they? Right? Because what is balance when you are, uh, you know, a single person starting out your career is different. Yeah. And what you need from a full life perspective when you protect potentially a new parent or have elder care responsibilities or, or competing in a triathlon and want to train for that, whatever it looks like. Oh, my stars. So that one's not on my list. It hasn't been. <laughs> and it's not going to be. So just going to say that to start. Um, I think, I mean, you, you hit it when you spoke about differences at ages and stages. And like we human beings are incredibly complicated and complex and beautiful and rich. And we are works in progress, like always works in progress it, with a little bit of luck. I will be till the day I die, literally continuing to evolve and become something new, something more. So the richness, I think, whether it's career or personal, we can take this whatever direction makes most sense to you, is just really thinking about what you need, what you want, what gives you joy, what you understand about yourself. Maybe that's a better way to say it. What you understand about yourself at this age and stage, who you are, what drives you, what, what does the world around you mean to you? What is your job giving you? What, what doesn't feel good? Are you feeling like you're missing something, but you don't know what it is? All of that introspection, I I have built into my life practice and I, I try very hard to help other people when I'm mentoring them. You mentioned mentorship or working with them to help them take that kind of ownership and help me take that kind of ownership so that you can figure out with this age and stage, what is it that I need? Because there's one thing that we know for sure is that time is going to pass mm -hmm. and, and those years will be filled with something and and if if you at some point look back and think that probably wasn't what I wanted to have been doing during those years you can't go back right. so people call it living in the moment or just being very present and it's hard and it doesn't mean you need to have all of the answers when you're being in the present or thinking about what you want in this age and stage but at least ask the questions of yourself you know, it, am I spending my time the way I want to? Am I feeling joy and happiness? Am I having what is important to me? And am I getting those things in my life? Sometimes it's career. And when you feel like it's not giving you those things that you need, it will prompt you to start thinking about what's next. And there's a whole series of things you do when you start down that path. If it's on the personal side and you feel like you're just missing some sides of you that they're not being fed and fulfilled, whether it's family or hobbies or creativity, it's something you have to see it first before you can figure out what to do about it. I'm curious as you think about some of your earlier and, you know, as you move through different industries and different jobs, um, Give us an example of some of the questions that you had to actually work through yourself to make those intentional choices. What did that look like for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I can use my most recent career change, perhaps, just because it's so clear. I worked for an organization that I truly loved. I loved the product. I felt a great affinity to what we did. The organization was so good for me in my development, the experiences, the support of people, including very senior leaders. I loved it. But I reached a point where, through that self-reflection, I realized that one of the things I need is to feel that I'm personally challenged in a way where I don't know if I know how to do something. Like I need to, sometimes I call it the edge of discomfort. I need to be in an organization or a situation or a project where I'm not sure how to get things done. And I was starting to realize that as challenging as the work was and as much as I loved the organization, I was feeling a little too complacent that I knew how to get things done around here. I, I knew the rules of engagement, the different people and what were dear to them. And, and I wasn't feeling that discomfort of, and I wanted to know if I still had it. Like Cheryl, wow. have you still got it? How do you know that? So um, started to 
go through the process and I'm very rigorous in the process about, well, what does that mean and what might it take to get there? And I got to a point where I had a very open conversation with my boss at the time saying, I think I'm going to need to look for my next opportunity and it's going to be outside the company and started to talk to other people in my network, uh, a sponsor who's been so beautiful to me in my life about what that meant. And, and I ended up coming to Chorus Entertainment, which was an industry I had never worked in and basically knew nothing about. I didn't know any of the people. Um, I really didn't know our products. And, and it was literally a position that I hadn't sat in that seat before. So it couldn't have been more challenging. So I knew that I wanted and I, I clarified the feeling of there's something not right into. I need to feel that I don't know if I know what I'm doing so I can yeah. figure out if I can still do that. It taps into what I need for myself. And after a period of time, doesn't just happen when you want it, but after a period of time, I found this role in this company it, and it's been a blessing. I love it. So you, you, I, I hear you saying I was, you were really obviously very much in tune with how you were feeling and the reflection, that's a muscle that you built to reflect and really understand and feel that. Um, I heard you say you sought out external sponsorship or mentorship, people in your network that give you good guidance and a good sounding board. But also you had a really strong relationship clearly with the people that you worked with or reported to, right, who 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 had some level of support for you. They didn't say, okay, you're out the door tomorrow. That's it. Thank you very much. Right. And helping you make yes. this transition. How did that feel to have sort of you know, were you that intentional in the moment or is it as you sort of yes. look back at it that it kind of fell together? No, Tell it was that intentional. And obviously to your earlier point about age and stage, I don't sure I could have been that person all the way at 25, but being 25 plus at the moment, um, <laughs> I've done that a couple of times and, and it's come through, I mean, I talked about years passing and and maybe not being what you would have chosen if you were choosing. Like I, I did do that earlier on in my career. I was at an organization for quite a long time, having things happen to me as opposed to me saying, okay, what is it that I want? And that's, that was a lesson, that feeling of loss almost that I didn't, I didn't intentionally choose that for myself. I don't regret it because you don't right. know how things would have been, but I didn't. So I built that reflection and the network and finding the people who would support me. But I also built a lot of agency, I guess, and a lot of belief that um, I was an adult living an adult life and that I was working with other adults. So every time I started to think that I needed something new, whether it was a new job in the company or to move outside, I would have a really honest conversation with my boss. I can't control how they would respond to it but along the way I would build an adult relationship so we could have that conversation and it hasn't um it hasn't hurt me to my knowledge but it doesn't it actually doesn't matter because if right. it gets to that point where I need with my agency and I feel like it's responsible for me to talk to my boss and as I say I've done it a couple of times and it's never hurt me um then we can talk about it together I love that and I love the fact that, you know, you respect yourself enough uh, and take your own life and career seriously enough. You want to be able to point to the time when you made the decision to go left or to go right or to stay the course, but that those are intentional decisions, not just flowing with the, the waves uh, or the so direction easy. that someone else pushes or pulls you. Yeah. Yeah. And then it is a, it is a loss to have years pass and, and realize that that's not what you would have chosen for yourself if you were in charge of your own life. I, I, having experienced that, and it's not that they were bad years, they just weren't purposeful years. So I, I really encourage that from other people. How empowering, I love that. Um, you did mention a sponsor or mentor. Tell me about what kind of a role those types of people, and pe we give them different labels depending on who we are, but those um, influences, those sounding boards, you know, tell us about what, what kind of a role they've had in your life. Oh, my stars, so many people. Um, I, I Maybe I'll, I'll categorize. There's The ones that jump to mind are the ones that I always ask people to make sure they have in their lives. And that's the challenger 
like the blunt person who will call you on it, who mm-hmm. will say you're being ridiculous. And, and many people who may know me know that that literally was advice from my boss once when I was being ridiculous and it was a little bit of a, don't be so silly. Um, or the person that said, you're saying no to yourself. Why would you do that? Let somebody else say no to you. Like the, the folks that don't empathize and just be a welcoming ear, but the ones who will say, hold on a second, you're not being smart here. Those people have been absolutely invaluable to me. Mm -hmm. And I treasure them. I find those people and I I hang on to them. Um, There's another, I'm thinking of one particular person and this is early on in my career. And it was the first time that I had had a senior woman boss of my function. And I would say it's, it's been important to me to have people that I can see myself in, or maybe it's a better way to say this, help me see myself better. When I was coming up, there were very few women executives and the few that there were didn't feel like me, didn't look like me, didn't have the life experience that I had. And it's strange to realize how important that is. Like it shouldn't be, but it is. If you can't see it, and people say this all the time, if you can't see it, you don't know you can be it. But when you feel that that was actually a limiting thing, when you said, well, I can't be that, so I don't know what I can be. So the first time I saw a woman executive that had similar sense of humor and characteristics and level of showing up in a way at work that I said, I didn't know you could be that way as a woman executive at work. All of a sudden it was possible for me. She changed my life quite literally. And strangely enough, recently I was having a a networking coffee catch up with someone I worked with in the past that, that I would hopefully be a sponsor for if she ever needs me. And she said that I had been that to her. And that Mm -hmm. was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever heard. I think what she said was seeing that a woman executive who was really smart and respected could also be goofy was empowering to her. It's like, I, I love that because yes, you, if you play music, I will dance, I will laugh, I will make jokes and, but I want to love my life. And if that shows up as a little bit goofy while I'm doing a good job, yeah. you, you don't have to just be one thing. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. And, and just, it doesn't take necessarily 20 people, but seeing a glimmer of something in one person made a huge difference. Uh, yeah, and I think really, that really did. And honestly, I mean, we're talking about this from a gender perspective, right. but, and we're 50% of the population. And if we can feel that it, we have to use that knowledge to think about what it must feel like to be a black woman or from the black communities or or people of color or a person with disability or you know indigenous peoples and think about if you can't see that when it's not 50 percent of the population and and how can we use what we've learned and what we see in our own eyes to help lift up and support for others like i think that if we can help to do that that will be extremely powerful yeah hopefully we're making some progress but yeah, we hope to make progress, but there's a long ways to go. And I think one of the things that strikes me from what you just said is that you, you may not have the luxury of seeing the whole package look the same, right? Um, but if you can find elements of role models that that look familiar to you, that you know, hold on to those pieces, whether it's the goofy part or the science background that's not common in HR. And I know that that was Cheryl's first degree. You know, like if those are some of the things that you can that you can latch on to, right? And see that just to those see are enough differences, right? Yeah. We talk about inclusivity, but we have to actually see that at work, see different styles succeeding and different backgrounds succeeding and challenge all the assumptions to make room for everyone. Right. And you're giving permission to a lot of people, I think, who are listening to say, if someone's asking you for advice give them the real advice. Don't, don't, don't give them what you think they need to hear yeah. uh, or sorry, what they, what they may want to hear, or the, as you said, the empathetic ear only, but yeah. uh, share what you really are hearing and ask some well, good questions. 
And that goes to mentorship, right? I mean, every mentoring relationship is different and it has to start with what the person needs from you. Right. Um, but if what they're, they need, what they're asking for, not what you think they need, what they're saying they need, it's got to be anchored in what they want, um, is, is real advice on how to understand themselves, how to present themselves, how to use what they've got to get what they want next. They need you to give them real advice. That's not an empathetic conversation. And I remember one woman that I did mentor through Women in Film and Television. And I remember giving her feedback on how she presented herself, her branding story, how she described what she was, who, what she did. And I told her it was confusing. And I, I will never forget, she said, nobody's ever said that to me before. They all just tell me this is a great job and, and well done and well written. And, and she took it away. I loved her because she did all the homework I ever set her. And she used the feedback about what was confusing and why it was confusing and how that was getting in her way in order to craft something that actually was much more powerful and, and not because of my mentoring, but she's incredibly successful today. Awesome, that's great. Um, so as a people leader now in a successful organization and as many others of, who are watching this today are in similar roles, what do you think is important for organizations to be focusing on to continue to advance equity and equality? Um, maybe the first thing is, is not to assume it's sorted. We, we haven't solved the problem. Okay. It's still there. And I think that's probably the number one focus. There was um, there's all kinds of data about all of these things. As you said, I've got a an analytical mindset and science was my first true love. And, and so I do a ton of research and look at data and try and see what informs what. And, and I think it was McKinsey did a study not that long ago and showed that more, many more men than women believe that we're past this. Like it's it's done. The system is fixed and and it isn't. And and I think most women would say that there are still um, biases and stereotypes and systems in place, whether it's age and stage or networking or affinity bias or all of the things that the unspoken things that get in the way that are still there. So I would say we can't we can't assume it's done. I remember doing a piece of research years ago. Um, this is decades ago and trying to see was education gonna be the magic bullet? Because back in that day, it was all about build the business case. If you prove it with data, well then leaders will have to you know, be more right. gender equitable. That has been proven to be false. Right. The other thing was education will solve it once we, we just don't have enough women coming through the pipeline of education with the qualifications. Well, when I did the research, it showed the period of time over which it was gender balanced on people graduating with degrees in virtually every discipline. It wasn't 100%, but it was well over 90% of the disciplines I looked at with the high impact roles and careers. And, and those women had been in workplace at that point for you know 10 plus years. It wasn't new information. And that hadn't moved the needle yet. I think that's when I went through a bit of a, okay, what, what is it then? And how do you move something that's so unspoken and so systemic and, and built in? And, and so I believe that we have to acknowledge we're not past it. We have to talk about it really openly and plainly and, and just comment on here's what the numbers look like. Is that good enough? What's in the way? Chorus, again, I'm, I'm very happy and blessed to say our board is five out of 12 are women. Our executive leadership team, not just the executive team, but the next layer of level, where I think we're at 47% women. So I'm in that kind of an organization, but it also doesn't mean that we can be complacent. So trying to show the numbers, look at the barriers, talk about it, be overt about it. Yeah. No, we're far from being over it. I think that's absolutely the truth. And 
Um, what's interesting to see is, uh, you know, is it more about how your organization focuses it? I know you're also a proponent of thinking about the full ecosystem and how does the ecosystem contribute to creating that equitable and equity oriented. Um, exactly. Yeah. So that's the way we're looking at it here. I mean, I've obviously always believed that, that it's an ecosystem. And if you're working on one piece but you don't work on another piece, it's not sustainable because we want sustainability. We want sustainable progress and incremental improvements as we go. So the way we look at diversity, equity, and inclusion and representation and sustainability of that kind of fairness is we look at our workforce and mm -hmm. our culture and our work environment and our people processes, but we also look at our industry. And so that's where women in film and television or women in communication and technology or some of our content related sponsorship programs and mentorship programs and development internships, because if the industry doesn't have equity and people preparing and rich experiences, where are you going to hire from, right? You're, we're, we're in a, a closed system, but you also need to look at the third piece on that ecosystem is then, well, the work that you're doing, the product the content in our world that you're creating, how do you look at diversity and equity and inclusion in your product? Sometimes I call it our potato chips, like our potato chips is, is you know, the content that we give out into the world. So how do we make sure that the industry can support the workforce that we need so that we can have the products that truly represent community? And so we have strategies that work on all of them and where we can link multiple things together that's that's the beautiful piece like when we can have an internship program with someone who will so we've got some kind of tuition reimbursement internship mentorship programs where somebody can then come and work in our company for a period of time and then have influence over the product that we're creating and then that's sustainable and then they can go off to work in other places and then it it becomes even more powerful. It takes a village, right? It takes a village. If you want something sustainable, yeah. right? This isn't yeah. something that anyone should try and have the secret sauce and protect it and not tell anybody else. That that just actually doesn't work. Right, right. How have you seen things shift um, over the course of your career? Obviously, we've been through unprecedented times of late, um, but how have you seen strategies shift over time uh, in this area? Um, in the kind of diversity, equity, and inclusion, the gender yeah. equality piece, how oh, things shifted over time. I think the comfort in talking about it um, has shifted materially. To, for, and that's, that's good. I remember the first time that it was a leadership team meeting at a prior organization and it was mostly men and some women. And I remember when one of the men said at the end of the meeting that he was keeping track of the number of times someone was interrupted and the number of times people spoke. And he just threw that on the table at the end of the conversation. And I'd never seen anybody do that before. And I took that lesson. Not that I became that person, because it's a little bit harder for a woman to say, did you know women are interrupted many more times than men? Um, but what I took from that was, don't let it be invisible, talk about it. So whether it's measuring it and then sharing numbers with people, so it's not a surprise. Whether it's calling out a succession pipeline and how people are assessed differently and it looks like there's a pattern there's there's things that you can call out so i would say that that has changed for women what's changed over my career has been and i'm aging myself through all of this so i hate doing that but i would say that in my early career women didn't want to be um, highlighted as being a woman in leadership like if you had asked, I remember asking women to do things like this and they said, well, no, I don't want to be seen as different than the men. I don't, I didn't get where I am because I'm a woman. I don't want to be seen as a woman. Um, that was really prevalent when I was early in my career. And, and I did, I read another study that showed that that, that 
there's a safety in numbers and when you get to a certain critical mass. So when you've got the only situation and you're the only woman or you're one of two, you're not going to stand up and say, hey, I am woman, hear me roar. Let me be the one to tell you things. Um, but when maybe you're 20%, when you're 30%, then you have that comfort to sit in your own skin and be seen that way. And so that's changed for sure over my career. Yeah. It's good to see some of those progresses and it's so important, right? And, and you say just the ability to talk about it, well, we don't have change without conversation. So important that those conversations are visible, more no, data. Because these systems relevant. are invisible. That's the point. No mm -hmm. one, well, for a long time, nobody's gone out purposefully to try and put others down. It's just habit and it's what folks are comfortable with and things run on rails unless you disrupt them. So you've got yeah. to disrupt those things. Not the disruption. So for the women who are watching today, what advice do you have for them about advancing their own careers? <laughs> Just do it. Um, Just do it. So, yeah. What advice? I, I would say be, be very thoughtful. It goes back to that self-reflection piece. Yeah. Just really understand yourself. That would be the first thing I would say is make sure you really understand who you are, what makes you you, what you want out of life based on what you know now and it will change yeah. based on what you know now and why why is that what you want and to be able to really understand that takes a lot of work then from that have some kind of a network to help you put the plan together and start just moving along I mean it's theoretical but there's a lot of exercises and tactics you have to do in order to understand yourself and to be able to talk about that and understand what you want and what you don't want and why. And there's a lot of choices to be made on that too. You can't have everything all at once. You can have anything you want, but you can't have it all at once at the same time. Are there any skills that when you are mentoring women or as you've seen that, um, you know, skills or experiences that are particularly important if you are you know, looking to aspire to leadership roles that maybe women don't naturally get, or there are in the mm -hmm. systems biases towards maybe seeing those, um, looking for, you know, what are some of those skills and experiences that we really want to make sure that we have on our resume, if you will? Um, there's two things that popped, and I, so if anyone sees me writing, I just write down the word keywords so I can remember the question, so I go back to it properly. Um, I start with the premise that women are just fine the way they are. So the old school, I literally have, and I brought it here because I, I had to say, I found this in a storeroom yesterday, and this is a woman in leadership binder from 20 years ago. Look at that face. Isn't that awful? Um, I don't believe there's anything that needs fixing in women. So it's not about going out and learning how to do things a certain way or fill in skills that aren't there. Um, what I do really think women need to do is be very purposeful about the stories they can tell about their accomplishments mm -hmm. to be able to look around and say, what story can I tell about what I delivered, the project that I did, the skill that I learned, the impact that I had, it went from this sales to that sales or this program I created from nothing or I reorganized and accomplished this, collect those stories and get really, really good at figuring out how to tell those stories. Mm -hmm. um, that's my biggest point of advice to women who want to build their career, not just the titles, not just the time, but right. the explicit stories. And that's, so those are accomplishments, right? They can be skills, they can be projects, they can be something you've learned. Um, but it's in the telling of it. And that goes back to that. If you're, if you look and you say over this last, I don't know what right now I'm adding to my stories. Sometimes I, I call mm -hmm. it in mentorship, I'll call it the backpack. Like you write these things and you stick it in your backpack. And if there's nothing right now that you can write down on a card to stick in your backpack, that's going to prompt that. I need to start thinking about this. What more do I need? Do I need to volunteer for a new project? Do I need a new job? Do I need to um, challenge myself on how I do my work? Always be figuring out 
What are you writing down on your card to stick in your backpack? I love that. And if you can't, if you don't have the story that you want to tell, how do you figure out how to put yourself you in the position? You start thinking about it. Exactly. You start, what, what do I have in front of me? What are my tools? What are my people? What might that look like? Nothing happens just by accident. You have to, I mean, sometimes things do, but the good stuff comes when you're working it and you're figuring it out. And if it's even more beautiful if you've got a network of folks to help you do that. A good manager is great at helping you do that. I'm going to ask you a final question around what about networking and what you think is important about networking. And I want to remind people who are watching to, to put your questions in the Q&A because after this question, I'm going to start going through those. Um, Cheryl, you've mentioned networking a few times and we know that it's work uh, and we know that there's a difference between good networking and not so great networking. What are the one or two tips around networking that you'd like to share? Maybe the first tip is do it in your own, or if assuming you're in an organization working, do it in your own organization first. Um, I'm a big fan, as you might have noticed, like tend to do research and analyze and create models and write things down. I'm a big plan of creating relationship maps, like actually think about who in this organization do you do you work with the most and you need their support in order to be successful? Someone that's in a role you would love to have someday. Someone that seems to be your champion and a booster, but you're not sure why. Someone that doesn't seem to like you very much and, and seems to ignore you or put you down. Like map that out, figure out what it means to you. Where, what relationships do you need to be strongest? Is there something you need to understand and fix because it'll get in your way? Is there something you need to nurture because you're gonna be able to learn more from it? So that I always say start, and that's easier because they're in front of you and you've got that, right. that easy in, population in front of you. So I always say do that first. With external, it's not about lots of people. It's about fit for purpose, the people that you need for what, you need, um, and it's a give and a get. If you go out and you're networking because you want stuff from people and you want them to be of use to you, you're doing it. That is not sustainable. Um, right. If it's from a true interest to know people in industries that you're interested in or people with similar life views or career paths because there's mutual benefit, build the relationships, build the connections, without just having something you want from them, right. that that would be, and, and it's not cocktail parties and just knowing lots of people and having lots of names um, in your phone. It's about knowing that you've got a community. It's building the community and knowing people that know you because right. that'll come in handy when you need it. Again, the intentionality strikes me, right? So networking, you can find lots of ways to network and lots of people to network with, but the intentionality of what kinds of people are important to have in your network, how do you want to show up and contribute to that network? And what's yeah. the combination of people who are like you and people who you would like to be like, right? Yeah. Um, there's a there's a bunch of different objectives in there, but mapping yeah. it out is a great is a great practice and uh, gives you that framework, right? To let you know if you're doing a good job or a you have room to improve. Well, and it also helps you get started because it can be very vague if someone just says, just net, build a bigger network. It's like, well, how do you actually go about that? So one of the best things that a mentor or a manager or a coach can do is to give you some tools and say, okay, let's let's talk it through. Let's write, who do you think's already in your corner? Who would you love to be in your corner? What what would help you understand yourself more or a potential career path more? And, and the actual work, I had a coach once who made me do the work. The first time I had one of those coaches, she too changed my life. I've been so lucky, so many good people along the way. She sent me off with so much homework and it was dang hard. And, right. and I had to do the relationship mapping and the company research and the industry research and write the job description of the job I wanted to have if I had a magic wand. And, and, and that, so I use a lot of what I learned from her. Those are amazing exercises, terrific. All right, I'm gonna start shifting because I know we're gonna have lots of different questions come in as well. Um, here's one, an opportunity for you to share your stories, I think. 
How comfortable was Chorus giving you a role that was not something you had done before? And if they weren't, how did you convince them you were the right person for the role? Good they were amazingly good. The good part is that if, if anyone is in a large organization um, and you're in the kind of second in command role, you have a lot of accountability. Um, and then to go into the top role in a smaller organization is a very logical kind of career step. So that's what I did. So I was in a large organization. I didn't have the top seat of the function, but I led the functional strategy. I did most of the development for the functional team. I had a lot of the disciplines of HR that reported up into me. So I had all the building blocks um, that I would have needed. And what I was looking for was that, that one seat. So, you know, in going out and looking for it and having no surprise, the checklist of things that I was looking for, um, a smaller organization made sense. So that's what I did. And they didn't have any qualms because all of the things, the experiences that you mentioned, the different industries and the different types of companies, um, I think that probably gave them confidence that I could figure things out and and not just, I didn't just have one playbook that I would bring into this company in a role that I hadn't known before. That makes sense. And you were undoubtedly writing those stories and figuring that out as you went. Um, here's a question from uh, about really about what would you suggest three top DEIB strategies that you would recommend? Um, and I'm going to say specifically focusing on women in leadership. Um, strategies help me understand, Margo, just talk me through what do you think strategies? Yeah, so I think we're looking for what are some of the initiatives or a you know, okay. how would you, if your objective is to elevate women in leadership, what are some of the three, um, what are, what are three of the top strategies that you've seen work? Um, measurement. Mm -hmm. I will always start with, you've got to measure it and then you've got to share that information broadly because that brings everything on into an explicit, here's what it is we're talking about. So right. if that's not already being done, for sure it's being measured when you're talking about gender, but is it being shared? Is it being talked about? Is it being shared in a way so that there's meaning from it so you can get some insights? I would say that is essential. Um, really being purposeful about it in talent reviews, talent management, succession planning, also essential. And from a gender perspective, easier to do because in general people show up um, in a gendered way uh, so that you can you can see the results and you can look at your pipeline and you can understand that without having to be intrusive into someone's identity. Um, and I, maybe the third thing I would say is, as you can tell by my waving this binder with this sad woman on the, I, I haven't in my career been a huge fan on separate learning and development programs for women, um, but a passionate advocate to make sure that all development programs have balanced gender representation. If there's something that's for leadership development, it, it needs to be 50-50 at least, I mean, from the, the pool that comes. And I've never run into a problem because as I find women are in general very eager to um, learn and advance and, and learn in community with other people. So leadership development programs and, and things like that tend to be attractive and folks right. want to put their names forward for those. So those would be the three, those are big rocks, but those are th very powerful zones to play in. They have impact. Right, and uh, there's a data theme all through those, a data and measurement theme through all of those, right? Like measure what you want to achieve, um, get insights from the data that you have, communicate those, have targets, like if 50%, uh, if you're doing leadership development, making sure that you have equity in, uh, in the yeah. participation, right? So that, that's there. Yeah. That's great. Um, can you speak to the importance of community involvement, volunteering, for instance? I volunteer mm -hmm. with several industry organizations currently, but not as much in my community. Do you suggest I have a better balance of work slash community volunteering? Oh, wonderful. I love that question. Um, because that, I guess I love it because it resonates very much with me. Not that the other questions aren't also wonderful. Um, I, I 
believe very firmly that my path has three different zones is one way I categorize it. One is the actual jobs in the companies. Another one is the education and continuing education in order to be able to do the job or get ready for the next job. Very purposeful zone of education, but also I have a very purposeful zone of community involvement. And it's a mix to the person that asked that question. For me, it's been a mix. Um, and it's been linked to personal development with a career lens as well as impact and meaning personally. And what I mean by that is the first time that I was on a board for a not-for-profit, I was really starting to see that I wanted more of a, um, a leadership role for myself where it was more governance for an organization, big picture, looking at all of the elements of an organization, sitting on a board for not-for-profit is one way to be sitting in a seat with that kind of experience. So it was additive to me from a career perspective, but I also have a very personal um, purpose about people not being alone, that that's what drives everything in me personally. So I saw a posting for a board seat on for the distress center in the region I live. So the idea of a distress center providing service to people who felt alone and lonely resonated with me personally. And I wanted to be part of helping and make that happen. So I chose it because it, it made sense from, from that perspective. Some of my other things have been very much industry like women in film and television because I wanted to know more about the industry and then serve to build the industry to be stronger but I work with Covenant House in Toronto and that's a personal I don't want young people to be alone that's the most tragic thing that there is and to support an organization that's there for them um, has personal meaning to me so I'd say f there's no should Maybe that's the first thing to say is that's one of the worst words that there is. There is no should. Where, where Margot started this morning, or yeah, it was this morning, um, about age and stage and being different people and wanting different things. Oh, my stars, if we boxed ourselves in to say that this was the way everybody should do anything, that would be so sad. So um, figure, just figure out what you're feeling you want more of. And if it feels like it's the right thing for you, if you feel a need to be more involved in the community, understand why. Um, because that's also big and vague. It's like, well, how do you go about that for one? And how do you choose what to do for another? So I have very purposeful conversations about what's of meaning to me and what organizations fit that meaning and then go find ways to get involved with them. There's a question here, and I, I think it's I think you have a unique perspective in some ways too on what does work life balance mean, and what does balance mean to you? How do you find balance? Cheryl? Yeah, and that's another zone where the word should is incendiary. To be honest, there is no should. I have been criticized much more than my fair share when I've been the happiest. When I am at my happiness happiest, I probably look I'm, that I'm very overextended. I'm spending too much time on work. I've got too many different things going on. I'm mentoring two dozen people and I'm sitting on two boards and that's my personal happy zone. And, and you know, the juggling ball of exercise maybe doesn't fit in there. That would bring me no joy. And as long as my doctor says I'm healthy, I'm not going to juggle it because somebody tells me I should. So I built my career with two little children and through many ages and stages of what I wanted and what I needed. And I definitely didn't always have it right, but balance isn't the word. There's no balance. Um, there's the word choice is coming up again. Yeah. I, I, what I wish for people is that they would empower themselves to choose, to say, here are all the things, hobby, creativity, art, work, my family, my spirituality, whatever the things are, and that you're seeing, does it feel like it's mixed right for me? And if it's not, what do I do about it? And somebody else's judgment on your balance and how you, what balls you're juggling, um, that's their business, not yours. And, and it is going to change. It's definitely yeah. going to change. And if the person who asked the question has children, I can completely empathize with how difficult that is because it 
it takes a lot of work to raise children and a lot of attention and a lot of mind time and it can be very overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, and my personal approach, this wouldn't even be my voice, but my approach was to figure out what the non-negotiables were for me and then put those firmly in sand. So yeah. my non-negotiable was that I wanted to be there in the morning when they woke up and I wanted to take them to school. And sometimes I wonder where I got the confidence to say that as a, I had my kids quite young, but it was a non-negotiable. It just was. So I got to work at 9, 930, whenever, when flexible hours weren't a thing, because that wasn't going to be something that I wouldn't do. I wasn't there for dinner. I wasn't there when they came home, but that was the thing that was important to me. And then I created rituals and, and space so that it felt like what I wanted and, and my memories of the time are good. So I feel good about my choices. What's the question you ask other women now about whether or not they have balance in their lives? Because just like you said, you didn't appear to be balanced to others. Somebody probably asked you, are you okay? Or it seems like things are not in balance. What do you ask women now? I start with how are they feeling? Okay. Right. Um, I mean, if you think of the think, feel, do, it's a model I love. It's a marketing change management communication model, but like people can think things and, and then they're, they're busy doing things, but how does it feel? And, yeah. and if you start there with it feeling overwhelming, if it, if you're feeling excited, if you start to dig into that, you'll see if there's cracks, if it's happened to you or if it feels right. Um, and it usually takes some time to unpack and figure out what to do about it. But people yeah. tend to know when it doesn't feel right. Right. You feel unsettled. You feel sad. You, I've gone through times in my life where I wake up in the middle of the night crying for weeks on end. I have had my dark, bad times, but you don't just sit in that. You think, okay, this isn't where I want to be. How do I get out of it? What does this mean? And what do I have to do about it? Where do I want to go next? Yeah. Um, there's a question in here about imposter syndrome. Did you ever mm -hmm. deal with imposter syndrome? You know, I've thought about that question a lot. And I would say no. Sometimes I attribute it to the fact that I went way too long before I got glasses. It's going to sound very weird, but I was, I don't know, short, so I couldn't see. Um, so everything was a blur for me for way too long till <laughs> I was well into high school. So I became a pretty insular person, I think. I mean, I was friendly and, and, but, I, I think I look at, I was socialized because of that to look at the world from an inside out. So when I was doing something in my career, I've realized this more recently, I wasn't thinking about how it looked to other people. I was looking at it from my perspective. So I would go and take jobs and do things and do presentations and, and, and I didn't realize till quite later that I never thought about how that would look to other people. Um, mm -hmm. And I can't say that that's something I could teach someone else to do. It's just the way I, I just came at everything from an inside out as opposed to an outside in. So I guess if there's a way you can anchor yourself in yourself and forget the other people to the extent possible, unless it's how are you serving them and what do they need from you? Um, maybe there's a muscle to be built there. Care a little bit less sometimes about what others say. You can't um, just make yourself care less, but yeah, easier yeah. said than done. Yeah. yeah. In terms of moving companies, there's a couple of questions in here about how do you identify companies? How do you work with recruiters? How do you how do you move from one organization to another? Is there a nugget of yeah. wisdom in there? Because I think we're approaching our last couple of questions here. So my approach has been to be um, purposeful about it and write stuff down and do some research. So a checklist. So on my checklist for this last change, for example, I was looking for Canadian owned and operated. I was looking for something in the GTA. I was looking for something in the top HR spot. Um, I wanted to go in an organization where there was some kind of a transformational challenge, some things that had to be figured out strategically. So I, I wrote down all of those lists. That coach who made me do the homework taught me how to do this. And then I went out and I started um, doing 
I did a little bit of research, but it more so it was, I started to put word out that I was taking phone calls and I was thinking that it was time, but I knew how to assess things that came in right. so that I could see, did it meet all the things I want? So I had to spend a fair bit of time figuring out and even the things on the list, some of them maybe were non-negotiable and some were like a product that that was something that would be in people's homes. Like I loved being part of a food manufacturing company. I loved having, making a hot dog. Well, now it's TV shows. And so that was on my list. I would just try and, and come up with something that you can use and, and check test uh, what comes in front of you. It makes decisions so much easier. It doesn't matter if they're professional decisions or personal decisions, right? Yeah. If it's important, um, right? That's the thing, if it's important, that's a balanced thing. If it's this important, put that much effort into it. Right, right. That makes good sense. Um, the final question here is around sponsors. Um, mm -hmm. It's difficult to find a good sponsor. Absolutely. It looks like everyone are challengers and not many are sponsors are available around sometimes. Um, it's really great to know about the career fulfillment is very important. Um, so I'm sorry, there's a few things in this one question. Um, she's asked if you want to share the career binder, but I suspect it's 20 years old and maybe intellectual property. So oh. you might need to be careful about that. Um, and she learned a lot today, but I'll go back to, I think the real question is here, you know, is, is how do you, how do you find a good sponsor and, and that mix between challenger and actually maybe more of an advocate or yeah. someone who's opening doors? Yeah. And I've had one person that I would say is 100% sponsor sits in that seat. I didn't ask for it. He became it for me. Um, mm -hmm. So I would say try and find people in your network who have some kind of positional power or networking power, know lots of people and and have them care about you because you can't tell them to be your sponsor. You can't even say, can you talk me up in other places and try and get me a job? But if they care about you and they're invested in your success, they'll do it. So it's yeah. on that relationship map, try and do that. And I would also say, build your muscles and be that for other people. I do that for a lot of, sometimes people think what they need is a mentor, but what they, when I talk to them, actually all I can do, all I can do, what I'm better suited to do is be more of a sponsor. If I spend some time with them and get to care about them and be invested in their success, then I introduce them to a lot of people and pass on their name and, and talk them up when, whenever I can, because that's what they need of me. Honestly, it's just being kind and surrounding yourself with people you care about and respect and then sharing that good news with other people. So find those people in your network and then they, they will be that for you. I would say that I, I've heard a lot of women too, just the permission to make that part of their days or their weeks is important too, because it takes time and it is part of your job, right? It's part of yeah. your job to be well networked in your organizations. It should be part of your job to be managing your career, whether it's inside that organization or eventually to leave. But it it's it's something you need to make space for right i want to it thank goes you back to if it's important right if it's important so, again right. if it's important and you only you can decide if it's important if it's not again there's no should you don't have to but it's it's a tool that really works it's going to take time thank you so very much cheryl um, there are other comments about how much people learned and how much they enjoyed the conversation so i want to thank you so much for being with us today um, for those of you who are watching, I want to remind you that we have the next conversation in our series on April the 11th, where Meredith Ryan Reed, who's the CEO at Versus Health, will be joining us. That should be an outstanding conversation. Um, we'd also really love for you to provide us with some feedback on what you heard today, what you liked, whether it was good use of your time, how we could improve. So please look in the chat um, for a link and you'll be able to provide us with that feedback as well. We really appreciate all of you joining us. Thank you again to Cheryl. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in today. I uh, hope you have a really wonderful week and uh, keep having conversations about elevating women in your networks. Take care. Bye for now.